Ah, oh, it's good. Well, I love the future. You and I have the same face. I Do you know. Realize that? It's your, your hair makes the difference. <laughs> Glad they're off the previous lectures and not just creeping into my Facebook. Is <laughs> that was a very elusive student. Like students that are always in the back, they literally can only recognize certain students by the back of their heads. And <laughs> 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 Thanks for being brave and come to, uh, for coming to this uh, session when uh, you all should have fun because you, uh, there will be some presentations. Um, this is a part of physical chemistry course. So the goal of the oh please uh, make yourself comfortable take tweets win back. If you're not presenting, just slip. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Goal of the course is to characterize materials by characterization methods like UEVs and NMR, but there will be no experiments in this course. The goal is to get understanding how this characterization is going and eventually to predict outcome of such characterization methods. The tool to get to this goal is quantum theory, which is hard. Therefore, attendees of this course smartly agree to follow a protocol of learning by doing instead of, in it, well, not instead, in addition to canonical academic lecturing and cohort. So uh, I admire, admire this young enthusiasts who sacrifice their personal time for Wednesday night labs, which are not in the schedule, so they come by the preview. And this learning by doing is going through the following bypass. Instead of getting equations and homeworks, one is learning how to model quantum processes through scientific computation through numerical modeling of quantum dynamics. And today is number three presentations. There will be one more based, hopefully, based on the individual research projects. And today, learning by doing, students teach students how to do quantum dynamics, at least in one dimensions. Our main, I'm already over the time, our goal is to finish in 50 minutes. So please present no longer than three minutes. If you present longer, I will come and push you from the stage. Questions are encouraged and very welcome, but not longer than one minute. <laughs> uh, what else? So, I think you do not mind me showing your photos. <laughs> Uh, I picked it from your previous presentations, okay. and uh, there are 12 presentations, 3 minutes each, so if no questions, we should technically be able to fit in 36 minutes, but it will not be possible. We probably will run over the time, but I will try my best to stop long discussions. Um, the slides 
are uploaded to the stage and they are labeled by first name of the presenter and by number. So you just come, click, and start presenting by, if you, if you are seeing Microsoft PowerPoint for the first time, you just got the difference. Click on this uh, little symbol to go into the presentation mode. Presentations are split on three categories. Theoretical background, technical programming, and applications to some simple models. With this, I announce the first speaker, Megan Schneider, who will refresh our understanding on momentum operator, simultaneous operator, and quantum evolution operator. So is yours. Three minutes are yours and mine. So the first operator is the Hamiltonian operator, and typically when we think of this operator, we think of seeing the eigenfunctions or eigenvalues, but it doesn't appear in the code, making the code independent of the Hamiltonian operator. So in that case, I tried to delete the Hamiltonian operator, and that makes the code fail because it is used to calculate the energy later in the code. As it is the set of possible outcomes when one measures energy, and then I included the equation for the Hamiltonian in case we have forgotten it or lost track of it. The parts of the Hamiltonian, it contains the mass, which is identified in the beginning of the code, along with the potential energy, and I just highlighted the initial potential energy. Um, the initial Momentum or the momentum operator, it collects momentum data by multiplying it with the wave function. And then the initial momentum is identified in the beginning in the equation at the bottom, which is the equation for momentum. But there are more details in the code on the momentum operator. And first we see in line 54 the direct Fourier transformation from momentum space to coordinate space, and then the conjugated form later on, and other forms of the momentum operator. I've specifically highlighted the px version or the state of momentum as it comes to be over time, and then the momentum data is collected over time. The evolution operator, it accumulates the observable at different times, and this can be seen in the equation and also in the code in line 62. The evolution operator accumulates the zeros at different times and it converts past into future, which we've seen the bottom code, the bottom equation in class. Okay, let's thank Megan. Uh, questions? Yes. What is, this, what is this code? What does it do? I'm sorry, I'm not good. Familiar with what yes, you yes, get yes. in class. The code is a code that Dimitri sent us in order to see how the observable moves throughout time and the expectation of where the electron will appear throughout time. The expectation value of some observables like momentum and position, how they evolve with time. And the, statistic, the statistical appearance of the electron in the space. Okay, just okay. base momentum too. Try, try the best you can. <laughs> I'm just I'm just wondering what it calculates. It just calculates the position and momentum of an electron as a function of, of time, in some potential. In the boundary conditions that are set up in the code. Your minute is over. Let's thank Morgan once again for presenting. So the next presentation is presenter number two. I don't remember who is it. Andrew Olson. Huh? Andrew Olson is welcome to the stage. So please uh, do not wait and um, come when it is your turn and push previous presenter out of the stage. Otherwise, we, we will not give him time. So uh, Andrew will uh, tell a little bit more details how operators are implemented in this code and specifically whether they obey expectations about uh, 
commutation relations. Three minutes are yours. Okay, so I'm talking about the commutation of momentum and position. So first, this is a basic commutation uh, equation. Uh, if you have regular numbers, it'll just be like 2 minus 2 if you plug in the values for a and b. So that will be equal to 0. That essentially means that you can look at both of these numbers um, simultaneously without affecting the other one. But if you plug in something like an operator, um, it'll not come out to 0 because there's a partial derivative. So it'll be equal to ih. Um, so this is why you cannot look at momentum and position simultaneously without affecting the other one. So this is a representation of a matrix in the MATLAB of the position operator. As you would expect, it's just a gradual increase along the diagonal. And then the uh, momentum operator um, is just a steady along the diagonal with a with a slight like angled line. Uh, this is reduces error. And as you can see from this, it just shows that it goes along in each direction. The box continues. And this is a commutator. And as you can see, the central peak along the diagonal goes away. Um, and that's the equation up top that I plugged into MATLAB. And then if you change the px from here to px3, it flattens it out more. So the, uh, and that's just to better analyze the graph. And uh, as you can see, sort of, from this picture, there's a little line across the diagonal. And if you zoom in on that, you'll see that it's not equal to zero at the diagonal. And this essentially is because it's the unit matrix times IH, which I showed you in the second slide. So that's why it's not equal to zero there. Yeah, any questions? Let's thank Andrew. <laughs> questions? <clears throat> I do have one. Uh, connection between sharp peaks at the edge for your momentum operator and boundary conditions. Uh, yes or no? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. Thanks for answering the question. Last chance to ask more questions. If no, then thanks once again. Next presenter. We <laughs> London yeah. Johnson. So, again, we continue our journey into background of the um, propagation of wave function, and he will cover some subjects on how to oh. propagate wave packets yeah. with different yeah. alternative methods. Um, so to answer your question earlier, the uh, the code basically takes a Gaussian wave packet and evolves it in time, and then it will measure the expectation value of position, momentum, and uh, I feel like there's one other thing that it because there are three mm -hmm. right, one other thing I feel like I can't remember exactly what it is right now. <laughs> um, so the it does it by three different methods. So the first method that it does is it will convert the the initial function into momentum space. Of, uh, apply the evolution operator in momentum space and then do the inverse Fourier transform back into position space. Um, and then these are basically the code segments that do exactly that. Um, so I, uh, I was working from a text document because I don't have MATLAB on my computer, so sorry that this is kind of gross and unappealing. <laughs> um, so that's the first method that it um, uses to evolve the wave packet. Um, and in this case, the, uh, the momentum is not an operator, it's just the actual value of momentum. So that's why we can use that in momentum space. <clears throat> the, the second method takes the momentum, uh, the momentum operator, converts it into uh, position space, and then plugs that into the Hamiltonian and thereby the, uh, the evolution operator, and then evolves the wave packet in position space. Um, these are the, the code that we have in there to do all that. And then you just use a for loop to iterate the wave. Um, and the third method is to discretize the derivative in the form of a matrix and um, use the, like the, the definition of the momentum operator. So in this case, this is a momentum operator. 
And we basically use a matrix to achieve that um, using the Toeplitz matrices where you, you basically, you look at the point and then the, uh, so the, the matrix has zeros down the diagonals and then uh, positive one, I believe, on the upper diagonal and then negative one just below that main diagonal. And then you just have the IH bar hanging up front. Um, so then we discretize the derivative and then plug that into the Hamiltonian and the evolution operator and then iterate from there. And uh, that's the basics of how the code actually evolves things. Okay, we have time for one Questions? Yes. yes. What is the Fourier transform of a Gaussian? Uh, at the top of my head, it's it's the integral um, from negative infinity. No, to no, infinity. too much. Okay. It's another Gaussian. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? If no, let's thank Lando once again. And the presentations are continued by Mark Almi, who will focus on the other aspect of this model. He will focus on the initial conditions for this time propagation. How to set up these initial conditions, what are reasonable conditions, and how the change in the choice of initial conditions affects the outcome of the model. Here's the most. So, propagation of initial Gaussian. All right, so uh, this is the equation uh, from the actual code. And so this is it written in a more uh, equation understandable form. Uh, so the first part, the square root of the dx is, is the numeric norm, which just Gibbs operate is their size. Uh, and then, so the next part in red is the plane wave. That's uh, the propagation. And then the next part in yellow, gold, um, is the Gaussian. That's the actual wave. And then the last part is the ideal normalization, which uh, makes sure that the integral of the function as a total of one. And then, so, uh, I moved on too soon. So there were three variables, p naught, x naught, and x var, also known as sigma. Uh, so the p naught would be your momentum, your initial momentum. Uh, x naught would be your starting position. And uh, X bar would be your variance or how wide the Gaussian will be. So uh, this is the original code uh, with P naught at zero, uh, X naught at 30, and X var at two. So uh, you just let the code run and it kind of just stays in the same spot and widens out as you would expect for zero momentum. And then to change the starting position, it just moves it over to the side. Not very interesting. Uh, and then as you start changing the momentum, it'll move a distance. And then changing the variance to one, uh, it becomes narrower and taller at first. And then you can see what happens to it, and uh, however, I chose variants that were too close to each other, and I couldn't really tell. So I put them side by side, and uh, variance one actually appears to have a wider base at the end. Uh, and then I wanted to see what happens if I crank to the initial momentum. Uh, up really high. Uh, I thought it would just zoom across the screen, but it actually kind of goes backwards. So I'm assuming that's an artifact in the code. 
Um, and then, so I decided to try to find where that happens in P0 7 was the last one where it went forward, as you would expect. And then starting with P0 8, it starts to get weird and <laughs> splits. <laughs> Okay, good thing. Mark. Questions? I have one. Okay. Uh, why there are two lines? Or more than one? Uh, they were representations of the different methods. So, right. um, if someone, you, you may answer that if someone doesn't like two lines, blame London to explain what they are. <laughs> um, your square root of dx. Would you agree that it is for replacing integration by summation? Because when you integrate, you need the size of your grid point. Yes? Yeah. OK. Thanks for answering. Uh, let's thank uh, Mark once again. And the next presenter is uh, Braden. Wait. Who will tell us more? about discrete representation of uh, functions for numerical modeling and maybe something, some other interesting things related to theoretical background. All right, mine's not too terribly complicated, just kind of general concept of, of uh, pretty much all numerical modeling. Uh, <coughs> so you always have some finite numerical error that you can kind of quantify depending on the method that you choose. Um, the error is always proportional to the discreteness that you, you choose to have, which has the node change of x. And in our code, it's also uh, dx. <coughs> and so a big concept of uh, doing computational analysis of real world problems is you, know, you can increase your accuracy if you uh, <coughs> decrease your uh, change of x. So, uh, but as you become smaller, in your, your, your change of x, you increase the cost due to increase your own computations. Uh, so you can modify that by uh, <coughs> changing, like I said, the grid spacing change of x or different uh, analysis types or derivational techniques like uh, the and the Rolaise method gives different uh, values of, of, of error. Um, and then equivalently, uh, space discretization can be applied to time discretization. Uh, so I'm going to just to visualize this uh, using the code. Uh, you can just zoom in on any of the <coughs> any of the wave functions set up. I chose psi two, uh, and you can see the uh, the finite value of the discretization there. Show of x. Um, so then you ask, can we still normalize it? Because the uh, normalization equation, per se, is uh, written at the top there uh, as an integral. Uh, but can you do that still with uh, finite uh, spacing? Uh, yes, because you just sum up the finite columns in this case. Uh, and note that they don't always have to be of equal spacing. I know a lot of computational methods uh, involve uh, varying the spacing Say if you have a really important part like spatially, uh, the grid spacing can be small there, and then far away you can make it large. Um, kind of tailor that to your own problems. Uh, but then you can see the code here uh, just takes that uh, that normalization, and uh, you just divide it. Uh, so you actually don't need to do it prior to calculation calculating the observables. Um, but when you do that to get the correct numbers, uh, you just you just simply divide by so I conjugate times psi. Um, well, that's the main idea. That's the thing. Brayden? And uh, entertain him with some questions. Why do we spend all this time with this method instead of using eigenstate expansion method for propagating forward in time? What is the reason to choose this uh, method? Um, well, it could be uh, you don't know the eigenstates of all the problems. Yes, so correct. Good. More questions? If no, let's thank Braden once again. Thanks.
Uh, Aaron Polanski is uh, invited to push Braden out from stage and present his part uh, because he will cover first practical aspect. He will help us to understand how to organize numerical data for exploring practical problems. Three minutes are yours. All right. So. Yeah, as I said, I had the accumulation of the expectation values, the organization, and the bundling of the observables. So I kind of wanted to like break it down super easy, even though I probably already know it. But you have to establish all of your variables at first. And then in this code, we took an average of all of the ver uh, variables we already had. And so that was the values that I decided to get the expectation values for. And to do that, you just like, I did all three of them, but obviously I'm not going to show you them all. They are all pretty much the same way to do it. They are. So to obtain all the real values of it, because it will not give you any of the imaginary values of it, so you have to type in real before the list of it. And then it'll give you the list right in the code at the bottom. And then you can also export it and save it into your computer. And then I showed how to do that here. All right, ask it where it is. And you find it, and then I took a weird little screenshot of where it's in a notepad over there. So that was like the list of the RAV of P3. And then I just had it in a notepad. But that's all you have to do to find the expectation values of whatever function or variable you want. And then the organization of the visual data. So in the code, I kind of wanted to talk about like where in the code you see like where it makes a graph or something. So in the first part, right before it makes it says pause, that's where it has like that first graph you see. And then when you hit enter, it will completely play the, play the code. And so then at the end there, it has like your time graphs and then all your subplots. So every time you see a figure, it makes a new figure. And then whenever you see subplot, I have a better example too. <laughs> so then I'll talk about that later. But in the, when you're actually using the code, you can either make a brand new blank figure just by typing figure and then plotting whatever specific value you wanted. So I just did the real value of psi 2. And there's some examples down there, too, of how you open a new figure and things like that. But this was the one I was talking about when you were bundling the observables into like one chart so you don't have everything opening up in a new figure. So you say figure, and then every time you want a new graph, you do subplot. And then you say what you want that graph to be. And so that was a much better example. OK, but thank Aaron. Anyone wants to revenge him by a question? He was silent, I'm not, I'm not asking anyone. So everyone is friendly with him. Can you scroll back two slides? Second from the end. This one? Yes. Yeah. So the frequency of oscillations are smaller here and larger here. So wavelength shortens. Why? <coughs> because uh, because it's interacting with the uh, it's free wave packet. Free wave. Yeah. Which, based on this figure, which direction does it go, left or right? It's going towards the right. Yes, correct. He, he answered correct, and I just uh, back him up. The wave packet is composed of plane waves of different frequencies, and quicker plane waves travel faster. And uh, quicker waves have shorter wavelengths. So for, therefore, fraction of plane waves that go quicker are here and slower are there. Make sense? Thank you, Aaron, for answering correctly about direction. But thank you once again. <laughs> so, next presentation is by Hannah Hanut, who will complete our skills and knowledge about visualizing data, saving them, and organizing them, so that we will be ready to go into applications. Is yours for three minutes? Okay.
Okay, yeah, I'll talk more about saving um, files and then how to visualize observables. Um, so saving files is really easy. You just need to you know save and then this right here saves it as a text file. And so the first word you would type in would be the name of your file. You can see I saved it here under initial momentum. I just chose PNOT. And then the second thing you would type in would be the variable that you're saving. And it's really easy if you don't remember what the file name is or where that is. You can just save your variable like as the same name, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, but then you do run into some problems when you're trying to save imaginary numbers. And so you see, I tried to save this, and then it only saved the real part. Um, so if you wanted to save something with imaginary numbers, you have to save the imaginary number, the imaginary part of it, under a new variable, and then you can save that variable. So you would end up separating it into two separate parts. Um, okay, so for visualizing observable, I graph the position over time, and as you can see, it increases linearly. And I just plotted this right here. And if you go through the code, I think you'll find that that is just the sum of all the positions over time. And then this next graph is the uncertainty over time, which is just graphing this right here. And two, if you go through the code, you'll see that like variance three is defined as a standard deviation, I'm pretty sure. And then you can see um, the uncertainty is increasing exponentially over time. And then this is the momentum over time. It's not labeled as nicely. But I just graphed, I just plotted this code, but this has real and imaginary parts, so I had to just plot the real parts, otherwise it'd be kind of weird. And from this, you can kind of see that the momentum is constant over time. Um, yeah. That's in <laughs> Any questions? How, oh, please. I saw a little hand. Maybe. Or you was just scratching? Oh. No? No, okay. Uh, so be careful, like brokers. <laughs> they cannot uh, put their hands out of pockets. Uh, you show that uncertainty of position grows, and uncertainty yeah. of momentum is constant. I think so, because I have uncertainty as its own graph. So, yep. yeah. so how does it correlate with uncertainty relation? Well, product product of these two uncertainties increases. Yes, correct answer. Okay. Where is uncertainty in momentum? I didn't see it. Well, I just I don't I just have uncertainty. It is not shown here, not shown. but it was computed by the presenter. Okay, let's thank Hannah once again. And next presenter is Christian News, who will start our journey into applications. So before we were looking on the wave packet that has no barriers and now it does so barriers what they are and are they needed for chemists thank you for the intro so as you said i'm working with, we're going to be working with barriers but when they get started where i'm going to explain to you the importance of why of us chemists in this is because when we're dealing with reactions we have an activation barrier that we have to get over before we can form our product from our reactants by um, getting over that hump that um, requires a certain amount of energy. By using the code um, from sliding 7 down to 27, we are able to add in barriers, change all the other variables to accomplish um, getting over the barrier and to see how different barriers affect it. To start with, I'll show you what a, it looks like with no barriers, just free space. It's a lot of move. And then I also show the observables if you guys would like to see more numerical. But as you can see, it just moves across the space with no problems. Now, I have the energies stayed the same throughout all these different ones, but I increase the energy barrier. So um, in this case, I put it so high that the, the wave just reflects directly back off because the energy cannot um, get over the barrier. So in our uh, real world, that means that we will need to add like thermal energy or something to allow the reactants to form the products. So now I'll show you how if our energy is greater than the barrier, we will be able, we will be able to make it through the barrier, and this is showing how products we formed. Um, well, then this is a partial pass form. Um, so because we are dealing with quantum, we are, we're not dealing with classical particles, so we will have some partial. So some will reflect back, some will move forward, and some will get trapped within the barrier. Um, 
I don't know why I skipped this one. And here's the passing through the barrier with no problems at all. As you can see, all of it made it through. And now, um, due, to the uh, due to the partial pass, we have this thing called transmission probability, and this is where we were able to calculate out the total product yield um, through this simulation. Um, I don't have the equation, but you do an integration, and you say the middle of the barrier is 0 0.0, and you will do the integration on this side to determine how much reactant is left, and you do the integration on the right side to determine how much uh, product it is. We'll be discussing this more later on. And now questions. No, thank Tristan. So our wave packets are not in the ground state. No, <laughs> but it's a good PK question or a uh, joke. Yep. Questions? Is the potential inside the barrier constant? Oh, uh, what? The potential inside the barrier. So it's zero, then some constant value, then goes back to zero again. Uh, so you're talking like the height of it, like how? No, no, no. The inside, it's constant. Oh, it's the same value. Yes, yeah, so I did not mess around with that. So I believe between all of them, they would be constant. So inside the potential is like a particle in a box. Uh, I would believe so. Mm. I'm not entirely sure where you're going. If you wait long enough, yeah. there will be, no, be like nothing on the top of the, of the barrier. Okay, it's not a box. It's barrier. But the solution inside the barrier, we would obtain with a constant potential. Wait, 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 wait. wait. This uh, okay. is uh, time-dependent solution. It's not uh, if you propagate long enough, everything will disappear from the room. Mm -hmm. Okay. More questions? Um, how does velocity, <laughs> average expectation value of velocity of momentum of a packet, behaves when it hundred percent reflects? 100% reflex. You can address it either verbally or show some of the figures that you have presented. Uh, so when uh, we have a 100% reflection, you see how it, it would bounce, but they will form back together. Um, so how does momentum change? Momentum, it should, um, it should be negative, going negative once it reflects back. Yes. Everyone agrees, right? Correct. Okay. Let's thank Christian once again. And uh, next presentation is by Jan Berg, who will focus our attention once again on the representation of the wave packets, showing that uh, probability distribution is not the only thing that one can tell about wave packets. So real and imaginary parts. So. Okay, so uh, I have the real and the imaginary parts of the wave packets. So throughout most of what everyone else has been talking about so far, uh, we've had some nice Gaussian curves throughout everything. Um, so basically with your plane waves that we have in our packets, uh, we can represent those as, um, as a Euler equation with a cosine being a real version and a sine with the imaginary part of it. So, uh, if we were to plot the, uh, the real parts, it would look something like this. And if we messed with the uh, momentum, we would actually get um, some, would get less um, juts up and down, less frills. Uh, it would look a little bit smoother. But um, basically, we still have an approximate Gaussian curve. And the same thing with the imaginary side value. So um, basically with this, uh, the code is basically just plot real with your x. And then um, this one is actually side 2. But if we place them on top of each other, we get a pretty nice Gaussian curve here. So this is it's basically just another representation of um, everything we've been talking about before. And with the Euler equation, if we square both the sine and the cosine, we end up with a um, we end up with a value of one, right? Because sine squared plus cosine squared is one. So we'll end up with a uh, if we lace this one on top of the next one. We'll, um, if we add these two together, we'll end up with a really nice smooth Gaussian curve going all the way across here. So. Thank you.
Any questions? Or it was crystal clear? Questions one, question two, question three. Crystal clear. Thanks for presenting. So, next uh, presentation is by Luke. So, um, in talk number four by Mark, it was introduced that the initial uh, condition can be specified by Gaussian wave fa uh, packet with three parameters position, momentum, and width. But not only initial condition, but the time development of the wave packet can be approximately represented by these characteristics like expectation value of position, momentum, and Luke will uh, focus our attention on this subject with more details. All right, so yeah. Um, dealing with expectation value of momentum position, this is represented very well with the uh, panels that are shown with it. So here you have the, uh, um, the set initial momentum of um, the atomic value 2. See, um, as position changes over time, it's linear with all um, evolutions. And then momentum is obviously continuous throughout when there's no barrier, nothing to deflect, nothing to slow it down. And then if you were to uh, double momentum, you see that again, um, the x value changing at twice the rate, momentum is um, twice it was in the first. Um, same thing where if you were to um, put a negative momentum, which just changes the direction. Again, um, change in position, decreasing at a linear rate with a constant. And then um, we have a barrier, like uh, Christian showed, you have elastic, um, elastic collision, the <coughs> barrier with momentum being conserved um, from four to negative four. And then uh, um, change in position is also um, symmetrical. And then within the code, the uh, um, expectation value of momentum is represented by um, kind of psi times the operator of momentum times um, just regular psi divided by the normalization of psi and kind of psi. And then um, the position expectation value is represented in the sum of two 200 by one matrices within the code with um, probability or prop three being the um, conjugate of the wave function times the wave function, um, and the x being represented as a 1 to 100 in divisions of 0.4 in a 200 by 1 matrix. And that's it. Okay, let them go. Any questions? If no, let's thank Luke once again and uh, reserve questions for the future because we need to speed up to be in time. So, Austin Brewer will continue the subject initiated by Luke of characterizing the dynamics of uh, wave function, wave packet, with expectation values. So, in addition to expectation of position and momentum, one can characterize wave packet by uncertainty, the width of the wave packet. And it is really interesting, just for curiosity, how does it behave in time. So Austin will initiate the discussion of the change of the uncertainty versus time <laughs> for free wave packet with zero potential and wave packet which is confined in the harmonic potential. What is yours? Great. Thanks for the introduction. I'll try to fly through this. I'll put a little asterisk at the start since these presentations are exploratory. Uh, that's exactly what this presentation was and my experience with the code. So if there's any corrections at the end, feel free to add on to what I had to say. So starting out with the uncertainty of position in free space, uh, we've seen this already demonstrated in the presentations before. We see this Gaussian curve of the position of an electron in free space over time. Um, again, this just depicts the uncertainty of where we're expecting to see it, that there's going to be some equilibrium position that we would you know, expect to see that uh, largest uncertainty of the electron in free space. Kind of similar to what we've seen in an electron in a, uh, in a box. Um, going on to uncertainty and mo momentum in free space, um, just the two pictures that we depicted in the labs on Wednesday nights. The one, first one is the one with imaginary parts, and I wouldn't even know how to start to explain that. 
Um, but the one after that, uh, the uncertainty with only real parts, is again what we've seen uh, with electrons in a box as well. As it's moving in a free space, um, the momentum over that time is going to you know, have variance as it you know, reaches the ends of those boxes or some end of the space. Um, energy uh, throughout a free space is going to remain constant as well. Um, and if you use those examples that we've seen, uh, the barriers are those kind of the energy constants where that electron has. And I'm just adding in the code that we're using through that. Um, let's see, it looks like that's already going. So this was an hour and a half of stress last night um, <laughs> that I really just did not understand. The original code that I used for the oscillation did not actually produce uh, oscillation, as you can see, it's just kind of throwing throwing stuff back and forth. Doesn't even reach the barrier. It looks like the closest I could achieve by kind of manipulating uh, a position as well as just kind of the momentum in the area. This is the closest I could get to that oscillation going back and forth between that barrier, um, and that's essentially what the oscillation does, anyways. So just a few errors in there. Um, and then when it comes to uncertainty in harmonic oscillators with position and momentum, position, as the code suggests, it's directly affected uh, through the oscillation. So we'd expect the position to oscillate back and forth as a sine function of the oscillator. And then finally, for the momentum, just through my logic, I figured that momentum uh, is directly influenced by energy previous, via previous uh, equations. And since energy is going to stay constant as well as a harmonic oscillator, I figured the momentum would stay constant as well. In conclusion, we just use these kind of, sorry, sorry. Uh, we use these, like uh, Christian already said, to kind of see reactions actually take place and use them to predict things that we use in real life. Okay. Questions? In that squiggly graph? Yes. Uncertainty is all real. There is no imaginary uncertainty. So what's, what's being plotted? That's the uncertainty of momentum. You know, that's a good question. In the code, it was coming back with imaginary parts. So that's why, obviously, only our observables are the real parts that we're going to predict, if that answers your question. So we would only use the real observables. Are you satisfied, or you want more? So the question oh, is, Let me reformulate, you, re code. reformulate your question and give uh, Austin a chance. Yeah. Is it correct that any variable has real and imaginary part, but imaginary part can be negligibly small? Yeah, I agree with that. But the uncertainty in that variable is only real. There is no imaginary standard deviation. Whatever variable you set up, if you use complex mm -hmm. type of variable, there will be non-zero complex part. If in practice it is zero, then this will be 10 to the numerical zero, like 10 to the minus 16th or 10 to the minus 30th. Numerical error it's will numerical. contribute everywhere. Um, Glad I could answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you support this answer? Yeah, I agree Good. with that. <laughs> um, a question that doesn't need to be answered right now. It is a word for all of us. Austin did a brave assumption that uncertainty of momentum for harmonic oscillator will be constant across the time. Do we want to believe it or we may find uh, this assumption false? Do not answer. Record this question and try to answer it next time we approach uh, meta code. Thanks, Austin. And literally, three minutes before end, Beth Palo will expand our knowledge about particles in the box. Within the course, our boxes were infinite. <coughs> now she will teach us what happens if, if the box has a finite height. What is it? Okay, so like you said, we've been focusing on particles in the box that are infinite, um, so therefore the particle is always stuck in the box and we can view it as that. Um, but for this, we are going to focus on a finite box, um, basically the opposite of what Christian was doing. His barriers would go up, our boxes are going to be going down. Um, so this is like a little just character of uh, what we have. Um, so as it comes here, it's going to drop into our box. If it has enough energy to get out of the box, then it can pass through um, and keep going. Um, and then the finite part of it is just the depth of our box. Um, so 
that gives us the amount of energy that we need to be able to get out of our box. Um, so with the box, there should be three, three possibilities. Um, so we could either trap part of our particle in the box, um, we could have the whole entire particle pass through our box, um, or we could get the entire particle to stay in our box. Um, so here is where part of our particle is going to stay in our box. Um, as you can see, the little oscillations in here show that the particle is in the box. Um, and you can also see it on the figure on the right over there too. Um, this section here would be our box barriers. Uh, the next way would be, so I increased the momentum in this. Everything else was kept the same. Um, and as you can see, everything went through the box. There's still um, slight, slight part of the particle in the box, but pretty neg negligible. Um, and then the third way, you should be able to trap it all in the box. I wasn't able to entirely get this to do it. Um, the only way I could get it to start was to increase the depth of the barrier. Um, so it's a little bit of a different, different um, composition than the last two graphs. Um, I wasn't able to just lower the, the momentum levels because after, or like below one, then it just started doing some wonky things like Mark was saying after 8.54. Um, but yeah, so that should be possible as well. Okay, let's thank Ben. Questions? <laughs> so, what is this in uh, the real world apps aspect as we discussed in the lab on Wednesday? <laughs> There's a real world aspect to a particle in a box and it trying to overcome energy and it getting trapped. Well, like the activation of energies of everything. Um, so if a chemical reaction is occurring, it needs to reach, reach the activation energy to actually occur. But a uh, particle being trapped is a different way than a barrier. Right. It would have a negative, negative velocity rather than the positive. Think of redox reactions. OK. So this is, <laughs> this is showing the reduction part of the redox reaction, yes. And then the barrier would be the oxidation part. Excellent. Thank, thanks for answering. More questions? More, uh, if no, let's thank Beth once again. So, uh, many thanks for everyone for impressive presentation and for completing in time. Everyone who participated participated is getting ranked in the grade equivalent to two successful homework. So if homework is 100 points, presentation is 200 points. With this, uh, let's Depart and looking forward to see you on Monday, 11 a.m. here in class. Yeah, it's not very gross, it's just an apple and mango.